whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I Good, good father to you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. As Sister Lynn comes tonight, just give her a round of applause as she comes. Because she is such a great teacher. And um, if you were here Sunday, did you not enjoy the family message? Did they not all four do a wonderful job Sunday morning? But I'm looking forward to tonight as well. Amen. Is it on? So over the next several weeks, our study is still coming from Dr. De David Jeremiah's book, When Your World Falls Apart. Um, David Jeremiah uses his experience with cancer, along with the experiences of some of his friends, to paint a picture of the Christian life and the Christian journey, and to demonstrate how the Lord is our final destination, 
and how he, to demonstrate how he strengthens us and, is, and sustains us each step of the way. In chapters 1 and 2, Dr. Jeremiah sh- shared how he dealt with disruptions along with his, his journey with cancer. And then in this week's lesson in chapter 3, Dr. David Jeremiah starts out the chapter by sharing an experience of one of his friends, a Dr. John Hovey, who was a surgeon. And Dr. Hovey writes a little excerpt in his book, and he talks about how he had gone to school for over 25 years, and then he had been in his surgical practice for over 25 years working in um He just felt like he was at the prime of his career, and when he was walking on the beach one day with his wife, his wife noticed that he was walking a little differently. His arm was not swinging in rhythm or just was not swinging right. And then he noticed when he began to do surgery that he had a a difficult time with just simple little things, picking up things, being able to move things the correct way. And as it went on, it really began to disrupt his career, and he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And so we all know Parkinson's disease would make it almost impossible for a surgeon to be able to fulfill his career. So he really had to stop and take a step back and look at himself and ask the question, is, am I defined by my career or by, am I by my profession or am I defined by who I am in Christ but as with my discipleship in Christ? So he stepped back. And he, of course, had to make some life changes and adjustments. But he went on to describe how he began to dig into different interests and different hobbies. He began to take on a a craftsman or a woodworking skill. He began to do carpentry work. He began to do more work with his church, do more ministry work. He talked about how he began to spend more time with his family. He had the opportunity to spend more time in God's Word, more time in ministry. He began to tithe more and more experiences. And it ended up, he said, you know, through this... Through this disruption along my path, along my journey, he said, I can sit back and I can look at it and I can say, thank God for Parkinson's disease because it changed my life. I I began to get those good things out of life. So in tonight's lesson, that's what we want to talk a little bit about. We want to talk about those situations when we come to that all we can do is stop and we can say, Lord, I need help. And, you know, along life's journey, we're going to be coming tonight from Psalms um, 121. So this, in the Psalms, Psalms 120 through Psalms 135 are called Psalms of Ascent. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. But we're going to look at this, and you've got your outline in front of you, and you, you can fill in the blanks as we go. But we're going to look at this, of where we can look for help along our journey and how the Lord sustains us in our journey. So if we look at Psalms 121, it says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall prepare thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. So as I said, Psalms 120 through Psalms 135 are called Psalms of Ascent. Oftentimes, the children of Israel would sing these songs as they traveled wherever they may live. There was three times during the year that they would travel back to Jerusalem. And as they traveled from wherever they lived, they were walking and they would sing these songs. They normally would start with Psalm 120 and work their way up as they progressed because Jerusalem Jerusalem was actually situated on a mountain or on a hill and it's surrounded by mountains. So as they're traveling, they're traveling up. That's why they're called Songs of Ascent. As they travel, they would, as they would get to different stages, they would begin to sing different songs, kind of like a cadence in the military. As they marched, they would sing these songs as encouragement. And so there was three times a year they would go for the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Some people may be traveling individually, packing themselves up. Some people may be packing with their families to go. But everybody started out on this journey, and as they started out, they start out at the foot of this hill, or this mountain, and they begin to look up. And we can see this here as we look at this um, Psalms 121. They begin to look up to where they're climbing. And at first, you would think it's exciting, isn't it? How many have ever packed up to go on a big trip? 
if you're like me, a lot of times when we're preparing to go on a big trip, I um, am, am very excited, but I also the night before, I, a lot of times I can't sleep very well because I'm anxious. I begin to think about everything. What am I going to leave? What do I need? I need to make sure I'm prepared. Have I got everything? Am I going to lose my tickets? A lot of times the night before, I'll dream about losing my pocketbook or losing tickets or forgetting something. So they were preparing to go on this journey to, to start up, travel up, this um, hill and they would begin to look at this mountain and then you can see the psalmist here in the first part of this chapter in the first verse it says I will look unto the he I will lift my eyes into the hill so if you can imagine a traveler getting ready to start on their journey and the first thing we want to realize is that when we when we, in this life this they're going to compare this ascent up to Jerusalem with our life our journey on this earth because we all need to realize that we're on a journey. As Christians, we're on a journey. We're on a journey of ascent. We're traveling upward, and our goal is not Jerusalem. Their goal is to go to Jerusalem to the top of the mountain so they can gather with their friends and their family and their loved ones, and they can worship. Our goal as Christians is on an upward journey as well so we can reach the home and presence of God and dwell with Him. So we want to go up parallel these our life's journey with this um, journey of ascent, this tra with this psalm of ascent here. So he begins to look out and he says, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look around. I'm going to look around at this mountain and just take in and prepare and plan for what I've got ahead of me. So imagine him standing there and just standing back gazing at the mountain. And I can just imagine this traveler looking and thinking, wow, look at the opportunities that mountain has. Boy, it's beautiful. I know at the very top, that's, that's Jerusalem. That's, not, that's my destination. That's where I'm going. And then he looks at it and he said, look at the beautiful trees. Look at the brush. I can just imagine the animals that are there. I know there are nooks and crannies and crevices and cliffs within that mountain that can offer me help and that it can offer me guidance. I, you know, I can imagine right here that if it starts to rain, there's probably a cave that I could slide into and I could get shelter. I can imagine if it gets too hot, there's probably a cliff that I could bend down under to get shade. I can imagine that if it's hungry, there may be some bushes there with some kind of berries or vegetations that I could stop and eat. So he's, he's looking around and he's planning and he's exploring and he's just looking at this mountain and he's thinking, just let me take in and plan and prepare and think about my journey. But just like I said, sometimes when I plan a large trip that anxiety creeps in, also, anxiety could creep in on with this traveler as well because not only did that mountain offer all of those great things, you know, he might have looked at it and he said, man, I know as I trek up this mountain, if I get hungry, I bet. Now, Jonathan and Heather, don't get angry with me. I've not been to Jerusalem, so I can't tell you exactly what kind of wild animals they have on the mountains in Jerusalem. But I'm going to pretend like right now they may have a rabbit. You know, he may say, <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm traveling up these hills, if I get hungry, I can set me a trap out, and I can catch me a rabbit, and I can have me a meal. I'm not worried about it. It's mighty what he was thinking about in conversation A, but now he's here, and he's getting ready to move, and he's thinking about conversation B. And he's thinking, man, there's steep, steep, steep cliffs on there. What if I get on one of those cliffs and my foot twist, if I twist my foot? Man, you know... Um, what, what if I can't find food? What if it's really hot? What if there's not enough shade? What if it's too steep for me to climb? There may be animals that I can hunt, but what if there are animals on that way that can hunt me? So he begins to think about all of these things, and when he, when he looks around, he realizes, hey, I don't know if looking around, if I'm comfortable going on this journey just by looking around at everything that's going on. So... I want to ask you this. We have different levels of problems in our life, don't we? When we start off in this journey called life, when we look around, don't we encounter things or situations that come up that we can look around and we can look at our resources and we can say, you know, I've started this Christian life. I've started this walk. I know if something comes up, I've got a pastor that I can call that's going to pray for me. I know I've got a parent that I can call that's going to give me good, solid Christian advice. I know I've got brothers and sisters that I can go to. I know I've got this and I've got that that I can depend on. But we also need to realize that there's times that we face situations in this life that looking around is not going to meet all of our needs. So when we look at this, um, the, in the next part, part B, 
of verse 1, it says, I will lift up my eyes from the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, I want to, I want to start by saying this. We look around from, for help, but we also sometimes we look within for help because we begin to, to take um, inspection and we begin to think about and we begin to count the cost and we need to think about what's going on. So here, sometimes when people read this in the King James Version, they read it as, I will look into the hills from whence comes my help. So they read it as if their help is coming from the hills. But actually, the punctuation was corrected in this in the New King James Version. If you read this, it reads, I will look into the hills, dash, whence comes my help, question mark. So he's looking in those hills. He's thinking about those, those possibilities of the good things. Then he's thinking about all of the bad things that could happen as he starts on that journey. There could be robbers. There could be pirates hiding in those cliffs. There could be thieves that are hiding in those cliffs. There could be dangerous animals that are in those cliffs. There's lots of things that could, that could happen. It could turn out terribly. So when I think about all of those things as I start on this journey, he's beginning to play in his mind. Okay, now if I get started and these things happen, where's my help going to come from? Where's my help going to come from? And doesn't that happen to us a lot of times? We go through life and there's some things that we tackle and we think, I know there, there are resources that I can go to to get help with this. But then when we start to play out other scenarios, we think, man, if that happens, where's my help going to come from? I know if Mark gets a flat tire in Benson, there's people he can call. If Mark gets a flat tire in New York, where's his help going to come from? You know, those are, those, are different, those are different situations. So he begins to think, he begins to look within. If these things happen, where's my help going to come from? Where am I going to get help from? So this traveler is here, and he's thinking about these things. And I love this scripture because he begins to answer himself in this next verse. He said, my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. So what? imagine here that you've got this traveler ready to start, examining the scene, looking at the hill, just just planning and preparing, thinking about the best, thinking about the worst, then saying, where's my help going to come from? Just beginning to question, and he answers himself. He has a monologue with himself. He said, I know my help comes from the Lord. And he didn't just stop there. He didn't just say, my help comes from a Lord. My help comes from a God. He said, my help comes from the Lord. He went the one and only, the one true and living God. He didn't stop there. He said, and just, just in case I get a little bit confused, let me encourage myself a little bit further. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So he goes a little further here to say, I'm, I know where my source of help is going to come from. So he realizes, he said, I can look around. I can look within. But if I'm going to make it on this journey, if I'm going to get up to the top at Jerusalem, I understand that my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So what he's doing is he's, I, in my mind, I imagine him here when he got to that part where he says, the maker of heaven and earth, I imagine he put his backpack on, he tightened his sandals, and he started walking. You know, he said, the, the, the one who created this mountain is who's going to help me climb the mountain. You know, he created the heavens. He created the earth. He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Not only did he create them, he created them, and he also sustains them. That's who's going to help me along this journey. And sometimes don't we need to do that? Don't we get our, find ourselves in situations where we realize there's problems that I'm facing that I understand that everybody around me loves me and they will support me the best I can. But how many of us have ever gotten to what um, Dr. David Jeremiah described at one point as a bend in the road? How many of us have ever come to a bend in the road? Do you know what I'm talking about? A sharp curve where you get right there at it and it doesn't just curve a little bit. It's pretty much a right turn and you can't see what's directly in front of you. I think about the curve right before your house, Mama, Mr. Darrell, on 242, that really sharp turn. Every time I go around that curve, I get just feel a little bit of anxiety building up as I'm getting there because you can't see what's on the exact other side of it. We face problems like that sometimes. We get to situations where we realize this is something that I don't know what's on the other side of this problem. And this is something that I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to handle it. And sometimes we face problems that we just have to own up and say, I can't do a thing about it. 
2018 was that year for me where I faced problems that I couldn't do anything about. Mark and I had been married for several years. Taylor and Lexi were adults, and 2018 was a disruptive year for me. It was a bend in the road that only the Lord brought me through. It started in March of 2018 when my daddy died, and I was nowhere close to prepared for it. I had prayed for my daddy for years, and he had been saved for approximately 18 months, and he died unexpectedly. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And that was something that I had a really hard time processing because I felt like the Lord was going to save him. But in my mind, I knew how things were going to change. Um, In my mind, I just played out how our relationship would change, how different things would be. And that's not how it worked out. And then I had to deal with a lot of guilt. You know, I should have been a better daughter. I should have done this and I should have done that. And that was things that I dealt with internally, that there was not one soul that could help me. I remember when I got the call that night that he had died, I remember thinking, this is the biggest mistake I've ever made. How did, how did he die and it was left like this? How did he die and this is how it's ended? And I can remember thinking, I, I can't fix this. And I can remember for the longest time just a feeling of dread and of guilt and just so many things. And I couldn't do anything about it. And I couldn't process that. And there was nothing I could do to make it better. Later on in the year, both of my daughters went through things that at, uh, lots of times as their mama, when they faced problems, there was a lot of times that Mark and I could come together and we could say, baby, this is what we're going to do. Honey, this is what we're going to do. And this is what we were going to handle. But they both faced situations that there was not a thing in the world that Mark could do. There was nothing I could do to fix it for him. We had to stop, and what we had to do is we had to say, where does my help come from? My help, it comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. As bad as this is, as hard as it is, he's the the author and the creator of this universe. He sustains it all, and if he can sustain all of this, he can get me through this. Sometimes we get the bends in the road. All we can do is stop. And ask the Lord, you just let me know what step to take next. Lord, do I go left? Do I go right? Lord, what word do I say? What do I do? You're going to have to guide me because at this point, I don't know what to do. Those are bends in the road. And sometimes what the enemy would like for us to do is to keep us at the bottom of the hill. He would like to keep us down there looking up, thinking that looks like a steep hill. Those those trees are too thick that forest is too thick i'm going to stay right here in the valley because if he can keep us at the valley he's going to keep us from enjoying what's at the top but what we have to do is just trust him to to help us to get beyond that next step so he said i'm going to my help it comes from the lord who made the heavens and the earth So he encouraged himself, and that's what we have to do at times. We have to encourage ourselves. We have to dig in. What do we know? And I want to stop here and say, what did this psalmist say? He said, my help comes from the Lord. He didn't stop, and he didn't say, my help came last week from the Lord. My help came last year from the Lord. He didn't stand at the foot of the mountain and say, my help will come next week. My help will come tomorrow from the Lord. He said, my help comes from the Lord. So we've got to realize that the help that the Lord provides for us comes continually. It's regular and it's ongoing. And that's what we've got to trust in is my help has come. It is coming. It's going to keep me coming. It brought me through this mountain last year at the last feast. It's going to bring me up this mountain this year. My help comes on a regular basis from the Lord. He said, the same Lord who made the heavens and the earth, the same one. That's, that's the power of what I'm talking about. So these little brushes, these little animals, these thieves that may be on this earth, it's nothing compared to the Lord because he's the creator of it all. You want to talk about problems? Let's don't focus on problems. Let's talk about the, pro- the power of the one that I'm depending on. Amen. He says, um, so when we face that bend in the road and we face that obstacle that we realize that we absolutely can't overcome by ourselves that's an opportunity for the lord to shine that's an opportunity for us to just grab a a hold of him and let him work 
in Jeremiah 32 and 27, the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I found there's nothing too hard for the Lord. So we, we realize that we can look around, we can look within, and we can look up for our help. But also we need to realize is that God offers us promises on our journey. He's promises, the first thing he's, he promised is that he perceives you. He sees you right where you are. In verses 3 and 4, he says, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. So the Lord sees you. You've got to remember, you may be standing at the bottom of the mountain looking up to Jerusalem. You know Jerusalem is there, but when you're at the bottom of the mountain, you can't see what's on top, can you? But you have to realize that the Lord is sitting up high, and he's looking low, and he sees everything about you. He knows exactly. Exactly what's going on. We can read in the Bible where it talks about that he knows the very hair on our head. The very hair on our head are numbered. So that's an important for us to realize is that he knows exactly who we are. He knows exactly where we are. He knows what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we've gone through, what we're going through, and what we are going to go through. He knows everything about us. So when we're on this journey and we think, Lord, I know you're up there somewhere, but I can't see you, we've got to remind ourselves that he sees us because it tells us here, it says, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. So what that means is he's not going to allow He's not going to allow your foot to be turned. As you're going up this road, you don't have to worry about tr twisting your ankle. He's right there. When it says he won't um, allow that foot to be moved, it's almost like he's a support. He's not just looking up on at you from the top of the mountain. He's walking beside you as if he's a staff that you hold in your right hand, like he's a walker that you're going to hold to support you. So, yes, he sees you from up high, but he's right there with you all along at the same time, supporting you as you walk, as you take each and every step. So he's supporting your feet. Each step you take along this journey, he knows the step before you take it. He's going to be right there with you to take that step with you to support you through it. it says, he that keeps thee will not slumber. So keeping, that means he that protects you, he that watches over you. It's like, um, like we have a bodyguard on this journey, if that makes any sense. He's right there walking with us. He's keeping us. He's guarding us. He's protecting us. He's watching over us. It says he does not sleep. And he does not slumber. Now, what about that? Think about that. All of those nights that we can't sleep. How many of you in here have had a sleepless night where you think things are going on in your mind and you just cannot go to sleep, just cannot find rest because you've got so many things that are happening, so many things that you're dealing with, so many things that you're going through. That's happened to me time and time again with work. I've worried and thought and thought. But, you know, it, this tells us he doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber. He doesn't get tired, Brother Tony. He's not on a time clock. He doesn't give... 14, 16 hours and then needs a little rest. He's awake all of the time, all of the time, seeing us, watching over us. And the important thing about this is this, he watches over us as a group. But I think sometimes it's hard for people to grasp a hold of the fact that he knows us intimately. He knows us individually. He knows us personally, one-on-one -on -one to watch us. But Brother Tony, as I said, it says the hairs of our head are numbered. Not just your hair. He knows your hair and my hair. And he knows each and every one of us what we're going through. It says he does not slumber. He says he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber or sleep. He's keeping Israel and he's keeping us. It says he's watching over. So as they're on this journey, they're saying you don't have to worry about what's on that cliff. You don't have to worry about what's through those trees. You don't have to worry about what's around that bend because God's right there with you, going before you, watching over you, guiding. He knows before you get there what you're going to face. Amen. And um, in his book, David Jeremiah told the story of a Bishop Quayle. It said he was a leader in the Methodist church, and he found himself up very late one night. He was up trying to think through all of the problems that was going on, all of the different things that were happening, and he was trying to solve those problems, and he couldn't sleep, and his Bible was opened up to Psalms 121. And on that um, particular night, he was frustrated, and he was overwhelmed. He was annoyed, and his was tired, and he happened to look down, and he read Psalm 21. And he read this scripture, that God never sleeps or never slumbers, that he watches over us day and night. 
And he said he was worrying about so many things instead of allowing, the God, allowing God to work through him. He was spending all of his time worrying. And said within himself he heard God speak to him and said, Quail, there's no need for both of us to stay up all night. I'm going to stay up anyway. You go to bed and get a good night's sleep. You know, when we find ourselves up at night when we can't sleep and we're worrying about things, turn to Psalms 121. That's a good prescription to turn to because God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He's watching over us. There's nothing that we experience that catches him off guard. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. There's nothing going to sneak up from the shadows that catches him off guard. He says he's going to be with us. He's not going to suffer our feet to be moved, and he's not going to sleep or slumber. He doesn't take time off. In, um, the next thing we find, next promise is that the Lord protects you. It, verse 5 says, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. So he promises on our journey to protect us. Now, again, Jonathan and Heather have been to Jerusalem, but in, the, in Dr. David Jeremiah's book, he talks about that how in the desert land, how, how um, dangerous the sun and the heat could be as they travel, that people could actually suffer from sunstrokes, that it, the air is so dry and it's so hot that it could be dangerous. So that was a concern that they would have as they traveled is, am I going to have shade? Am I, am I going to have shelter? But the Lord tells them here, and, and again, this is this traveler talking back and forth to himself. And just imagine in your mind as he's traveling up this hill, you know, maybe he got to a certain point, you know, he might have just been doing, you know, the simple things as he got started, but maybe he got to a certain point and it was getting a little tough and he begins to talk to himself. Whew, he's not asleep. He doesn't slumber. He knows how tough it is to get up this mountain. Maybe when it gets a little bit steeper, he begins to talk to himself. He said, mm, whew, it's hot. That sun is beating off the back of my neck. I'm, I'm hot, it's humid, it's dry, I need a little sip of water. That He begins to talk to himself and he said, the Lord, the Lord is your keeper. He's thy shade upon thy right hand. Now, the, the, it's significant that he used this metaphor here of the Lord's right hand. Throughout the Bible, when you read about the right hand, that signifies the Lord's strength. That's indicative of the Lord's strength. So what that's saying is the Lord's right hand, his strength, is what he's going to use to pick. It's his shade. Shade is provided to you in his right hand. So he's got you. He's holding you in his right hand. He's sheltering you, and he's providing you shade. With that arm, that hand that created the heavens and the earth, it talks about the, he the heavens are his firmament. Um, the heavens and the firmament are his handiwork. That's just little, that's just piddly work for him. That's just, but he's going to use his right hand, his arm with the strength, his hand with the strength. He's going to use his strength to shield and to protect you and to provide shade and comfort. And I want you to think about this. Now, this is, doesn't say it provided shelter on the journey because shelter takes you out of the heat, doesn't it? So the Lord's not telling us that on our journey that he's necessarily going to remove us from the sun because we're going to face things in this life, and it's going to get hot, and it's going to get uncomfortable, and it's going to be tough. Remember this is a journey of ascent. This is an uphill climb. If this were a journey of descent or a psalm of descent, we'd just be rolling down the hill and it would be easy. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a journey of ascent, an uphill climb. So we can expect struggles. I remember several years ago, Mark and I, we like to sometimes in October to go to the mountains, and we decided to go to Grandfather Mountain, and I was feeling especially young, I guess, that day. And Mark said, well, Lynn, right here's a place that we can park if you want to, and we can climb the rest of the way to the mountain. He said, or we can drive the west. I said, I, it feels good. We'll walk. <laughs> so I got out, and we started to climb, and I'm, in my little mind, I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, I'm climbing Grandfather Mountain. I'm trekking up Grandfather Mountain. And then I began to feel a little bit of the incline. <laughs> and then I was trekking up Grandfather Mountain. And we got right there to the, the close to the top, to right there to the top. And I had to stop for a minute because I felt like I was having a full-blown asthma attack. I was wheezing and everything else because the higher it got, 
the, the higher up we got, the steeper it climbed, the more difficult it got. So he's encouraging himself here. He said, but the Lord not necessarily going to take us out of the heat. But what he's going to do is he's going to use his power to shade us, to make it bearable for us, to make it, to allow us to get through that journey. He's going to provide us with what we need on this journey to make it to the next level and then the next level and the next level. And what we need on, at each level may look differently. So he's going to provide the shade with his right hand. It says, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. And when I thought about this, you know, you think about the sun just glaring down on you, and it's just hot, and it's steady, and it's heavy. Have we ever faced problems like that where it felt like it was just beating down on us? Maybe it was not anything sudden. Maybe it was just constant. Lord, when is this going to end? I have dealt with this mess for 18 months, day in and day out. I take one step forward and I take two steps back. Lord, what more? Can I? Sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes we find problems in our life that it's just like the sun beating down on us, just like the sun. But it tells us, he said, the sun may shine, but it will not smite you. It's not going to knock you down. It's not going to knock you over. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to take you out. You're going to face problems, and you're going to face problems that may be steady, and it may be consistent, but it's not going to smite you. And it says, in the moon, nor the moon by night. And think about that. I think about the moon. Sometimes don't we face problems that catch us off guard? Don't we face problems and situations that we struggle because we just don't know? Think about the night t- about nighttime. You know, um, we talked about people on this journey that they face sometimes sunstrokes because of the heat. But in the older, um, in the biblical times, people were worried about what they called people being moonstruck. They said that there was some type of power of the moon that would cause people to turn into lunatics. And people say, "Well, hey, that's that's just old fashioned." But that's where actually where our word lunatic comes from it's lunar so it says there's a you know as if there's a pull of the moon but really a lot of times in those things that are in the night how many how many of you have children or had children that need a night light because they're scared of the dark because they're scared of the dark how many of us as adults want a night light because we're scared of the dark because of what's unknown because of what's hidden because of what you can't see and sometimes don't we face problems or we get anxiety, we feel anxious because we don't know what's next. We can't see what's before us. We can't see what's around the corner. It's dark. It's dark and it's gloomy. But he said he's going to protect you in day, the daytime, when your enemy, when your problems, when your f- situations are facing you head on and they're just pounding down on you. He's going to help you with those problems. Those problems. How many of you have ever had situations where you could just feel something's wrong? You just know something's wrong, but you can't put your finger on it. You don't understand it, but you just know. He's letting us know in those situations, too, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to watch over you, so I'm going to be right there with you. I'm going to protect you. I, I am your keeper I'm your guard. I'm your bodyguard. I am going to shield you. I'm going to protect you. So isn't that encouragement on this life's journey when we face these situations that we know he's our keeper? And then in verse 7, we find that the Lord preserves us. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The Lord preserves us from evil. He's going to watch over us, and he's going to protect us from evil. We have to remember that as a child of God, for anything to come at us, it has to go through the Lord first. Mark before gave an illustration of a circle, and he said, We are the dot, and that there's a circle around that dot. Before anything can get to us in that dot, it's got to come through that, that circle. So... We need to realize we're going to face problems, but the Lord already knows what those problems are. If you go back and you'll read about Job, what happened in Job? It says the devil was walking to and forth, seeking whom he may devour. And what did the Lord say? Have you considered my servant Job? And he gave him stipulations. You can do this, but you can't do this. You can do this, but you can't do that. He uses things and he allows things at times. 
for our good and for his glory because for his ultimate end. But the Lord watches over us. He knows who we are. He knows what we are, what we're going through, and he knows how he's going to get us through those things. He protects us from evil. Does that mean evil's not going to come against us? It will come against us, but it will not overtake us. The Lord preserves our existence. He will, uh, he will preserve our soul from harm. When we, um, hold on, I've got so many pages. Hold on. In verse 8, it says, the Lord shall preserve, the, it says, the Lord shall preserve thee from evil. He shall preserve thy soul. So he will preserve our existence. So we may face things here on this earth, but as Christians, we know that this is not our final home. When we talk about our journey, that journey of ascent, what we're doing right here on earth is just a very, very short part of the story. That's kind of like what we've got here on earth is kind of like, At the beginning of this book, the forward's just a couple of pages. That, that's the forward right there. The rest of it's the story. The rest of that's the book. So what we've got right here on this earth is just the forward. That's not this. That this is not the life. The life is yet to come. So He's going to preserve our existence. He's guarding our soul. He's watching over our soul. So we have to realize that, that there's more than what we experience here on this life. We keep ourselves rooted and grounded in him as his children, and we hold on to him. There's more yet to come, and he's going to preserve our, our existence. The Lord preserves us every day in our goings out and our coming in. And this especially spoke to me. I thought, Lord, this is so sweet. Thank you for this. You know, we talk about, and there may be some people who are sitting out there, well, Lord... Thankfully, right now, I don't have any big problems. I don't have any constant. I don't have any steady problems. I don't have anything that I feel like is sneaking up on me. I don't have any issues that I'm dealing with. Thank the Lord my health is, my health is good. Thank the Lord this is. I'm just every day getting up, getting dressed, going to work, doing the same thing. Getting up, getting dressed, going to work, doing the same thing. You know what this tells us? He knows that too. He knows that too in the everyday things. You don't have to have anything drastic going on for, the, for you to have the Lord's attention. You don't have to be going through a great big thing. He knows you in the problems, in the storms. He knows you in the everyday mundane things of life. Sometimes people get overwhelmed by just the everyday things of life. You may say, well, I don't have anybody sick. I don't have anybody that, but I'm just struggling with just doing day to day. He's going to help you with the day to day too. There's no problem too big, but there's also no problem too small. I remember when Mark and I first got married, I would have headaches. And Mark asked me, he said, well, Lynn, did you pray about it? And I'm thinking, I'm not going to be praying about a headache. You know, everything going on, I'm not going to sit around and pray about a headache. And then finally one day the Lord said, you know, just showed me, you know, Lynn, I can take care of the big things, but I can take care of the big little things too. He's not limited. He's not limited. So in just those everyday things, in our everyday going out and coming in, in my going to work, the Lord blesses me at times with a parking space in Walmart, and I thank the Lord for him. He blesses me with so many things. He knows us by name. He knows everything about us. He knows our going out and our coming in day to day, everything about us. He's aware. He's not caught by surprise. He's not caught off guard. He preserves us every day, and he preserves us eternally from this time forth and forevermore. We as humans are limited in what we can do. Mark is, is strong. I would tell anybody he's my husband. He's strong. He can lift weights. But I would venture to say that today at 53, 54, oh, today at 54, Mark may not be able to lift as much weight as he could at 44. Mark can run today but at 54 today he may not be able to run as fast as he could at 44 now i believe that if something were to happen to me mark would use every bit of his strength and his power to protect me but mark is human and what mark is able to do is limited but we serve a god that does not grow weary 
He does not sleep. He does not slumber. He does not get tired. He does not run out of energy. Who is there preserving us every day? He doesn't get tired every day, day in, day out. Every single day, he's there to watch over us. His power's not limited. His energy's not limited. His interest is not limited. He never gets tired of watching over us. He never gets tired of protecting us. His strength does not fade. His energy and interest do not grow weary. So that's an important thing. I hope you've gained something from this today. I hope as you, as you wake up tomorrow morning and you start tomorrow's journey, you realize what are you traveling toward? We're traveling upward. We're traveling upward to one day meet the Lord in heaven. And as we travel this journey, tomorrow we may be traveling toward the, the bottom. And it may be smooth sailing. He's watching over us. Or tomorrow may be a steep climb. It may be like one of those grandfather mountain asthmatic experiences for me. It may be steep and it may be tough. But he's right there too. And that's what we just need to remind ourselves. The Lord is with us. The Lord's watching. And what we have to do is just stop and say, Lord, I need your help. Encourage ourselves on this journey. Stop and cry out. Remind ourselves, this psalmist, this were not two or three people speaking back and forth. This was a traveler talking to himself as he travels. Sometimes we need to do that. Just talk to myself, Lynn, you got problems today. Well, Lynn, honey, you got a big God. You know, Lynn, this is going on. Well, Lynn, let me tell you about who I serve. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Cry out to him. God bless you and may he keep you. Thank you so much. Amen. And I stand corrected. Um, I am not biased. She's just a, a solid teacher. Whether she's my wife or not, that was good. Good word. Thank you so much. And I, I want us to pray tonight, though, because uh, only God knows where we are in our situations. And um, and someone once said that, that success will be uphill. I mean, it, it, we don't coast to it. And if we're going to make it to heaven, we're going to be a tried people, uh, a tested people. But God is with us, and it was uh, just so well explained to us tonight. Um, you, you can stay seated if you like to. I just want to pray over you before you leave that God will just take care of us all as we go in and come out. Gracious God and Father, I just I ask tonight, remind us, remind us that we're not alone on this journey. For every born-again Christian listening to us tonight, here in this place and those who are watching online, Dear God, remind us that we are not alone. You are walking with us. And dear God, you know how every life in this setting has been disrupted this week, maybe even today. Dear God, you know the bends in the road that we're all facing, dear Lord. For some, it may be sickness. For some, it's decisions people are having to make, dear God, maybe with their finances or maybe with their family or maybe with a career situation. Maybe it's with kids going off to school. Maybe it's taking care of, of, of senior parents. Dear Lord, we don't know everything, but you do. I just ask tonight that you would remind everyone listening to me that we are not alone on this journey. You are walking with us, dear Lord, and you're not just walking with us. You're protecting us, and you're providing for what we need, and you're going to preserve us. You're going to see us through to the end, and we praise you for that. So, Lord, tonight, could you just give that fresh reminder? I know I've asked that, Lord, but through the person of the Holy Spirit, someone just needs to sense you in a very real way. Someone needs to sense you in a very personal way. Someone needs to hear you speaking that I have got this, and I am walking with you. You're not alone on that job. You're, you're not alone at school. You're not alone in that family situation. You're, you're not alone in this financial crisis. I am with you, and I am bigger than you, and I see more than you see, and I'm going to bring you through it. Lord, we'll give you praise now in advance for what you're going to do. We we'll give you praise now, dear Lord, on behalf of this people for the journey that you're going to bring us all through. We thank you, we praise you, and we consider it done in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Let it be so. Amen. Amen. We love you all. As a reminder now, Sunday, uh, Director Doug Bartlett will be with us in both services. Um, love for you to come and hear him. He's going to talk to us specifically uh, about witnessing the theme that we've, we've launched this year. And next Wednesday, I want all of you to come back. Now, but Sister Child will be teaching not from this book. We'll come back to this book in two weeks. And Brother Joe Dan Lee will be teaching that night. 
and then in three weeks I'll be back. But next Wednesday, Sister Chubb will talk to us about more of a hands-on approach to witnessing, okay? That's our theme, so we're going to get some preaching on it Sunday, some teaching on it next Tuesday. So don't miss. Come and be a part of it, okay? God bless you all. We love you.